Oh, it's that time of year again. The nights are getting a little colder, the leaves are changing color, and pumpkin spice is back. Depending on where you are, it might not feel like it, but those of us in the Northern Hemisphere are in the middle of fall. There's something about this season that captivated me this year especially, and I wanna talk about it. This CNN article describes fall as, quote, the season for all senses, the feel of cooler temperatures after a long summer, a warm, visually pleasing palette of reds, oranges, and browns. The taste of pumpkin spice in everything, the sound of crunching leaves underfoot, the smell of wood smoke. Fall is perhaps my favorite season, I may be biased as a Libra baby, but it's undeniably cozy and wholesome. It's also a time of significant change, it's literally a transitional season, but especially because of the school calendar and my birthday, fall always feels like the beginning of a new era. This year I found myself particularly excited for fall. I felt one chill and immediately grabbed a sweater, ready to assume the cozy position on my couch. I've been enjoying the rituals of bringing out old favorites, trying new seasons, seasonal foods. I'm not usually the type to get into the holiday spirit, but right now I am feeling it. What's happening to me? What makes these autumnal months so lovable and so monetizable? So this video is about the commodification of fall, aka fall as a product. I want to discuss how we experience seasons, and of course that involves spending money, but also how the companies that create these seasonal products capitalize on our nostalgia. And yes, of course, everything has been commodified. I know. But this video is about fall, okay? The performance of seasons. As I mentioned, I have historically been a bit of a Grinch about holiday spirit. Is there a fall equivalent to the Grinch? I just didn't grow up in a household that was super into seasonal decor or specific yearly traditions. Also important to note, I grew up in Southern California, a place with basically two seasons, hot or slightly chilly. Then I spent the last five years living in New York and experienced it all. I got used to four distinct seasons on the East Coast. This is my first fall since moving back to a warmer climate, and I think subconsciously I've been missing New York a little bit, so I've wanted to do the same seasonal rituals even if they don't make much sense for the setting or the weather, like trying to wear big bulky sweaters when it's still 80 degrees. This is where the performance of seasons comes in. We all have preconceived notions of what each time of year is supposed to look, smell, and feel like. This performance includes how you dress, what you eat and drink, perhaps re-watching nostalgic movies or TV shows, and surrounding yourself with seasonal decor. Before we continue, this portion of today's video is sponsored by ThreadUp. Big friend of the channel, if you're not already aware, ThreadUp is a massive online consignment and thrift store. At this point, I think about half of my wardrobe has come from ThreadUp, and I love it because I have found so many great pieces. I want to share some tips about how I thrift online, so here is the ThreadUp app. Number one, you've got to have a wish list. This time I was looking for corduroy pants, turtlenecks, mock necks, and a new crossbody bag. Number two, if you're shopping for any pants, you have to know your inseam. That's how I stop myself from buying pants that are like a foot too long for me. And number three, make sure you read the whole listing, especially pay attention to materials to see what you like or what you don't like. Now let's go into my picks. First is this turtleneck. It's Velvet by Graham and Spencer. I also have this crossbody bag. Yes, I found one. The brand is street level. The estimated retail is $48 and I got it for $18.99. This is a very simple but very wearable outfit. Black boots, comfy jeans, my everyday bag, and a comfy sweater. Next up, we've got this little mock neck from Reformation. Such a good base layer. I live for a mock neck. And it's paired with these cords from Dress Barn, these platform booties I've had forever. I just love the color and the fit of the pants. And imagine, imagine I pair it with this green coat. I think I'd be unstoppable. And last but not least, we have this moth sweater. Estimated retail was $76. I got it for $31.99. I mean, this is just fall colors, baby. And look at the, the bell sleeves. And here I have it paired with a nice pair of wide leg jeans and my green loafers. So I highly recommend using ThreadUp to find anything on your wish list. You can shop my picks with the link below and use code Tiffany to get an extra 30% off and free shipping for your first order. 
Let's get into fall aesthetics. One beloved feature of fall is the fashion. After a long summer, personally, I am sick of hot weather clothing. I don't want to see another pair of shorts again. Once temperatures cool down in fall, we can finally bring out pants, layers, jackets. I feel a lot more comfortable in these sorts of outfits, and I think it's a lot easier to be creative with your clothing compared to when it's 90 degrees and I don't want to wear anything. I finally get to work with more components. So I have to mention two notable memes regarding fall fashion. First, of course, Christian Girl Autumn, which as far as I know originated from this tweet in 2019. Hot girl summer is coming to an end. Get ready for Christian Girl Autumn with a photo of these two women twinning. For a certain time, if you were a white Christian woman, especially in the South, this was the look. It's very feminine, relatively modest. It's all about the perfectly curled but not brushed out balayaged hair, infinity scarf, big love luxury bag, a sweater, probably skinny jeans, and some riding boots or booties. There have been some really interesting articles written about the cultural significance of the meme, so I would check these out if you want to read more. I think the most shocking thing about Christian Girl Autumn was just the conformity. It's very strange to witness a duo or a group of women looking pretty identical. It's a bit uncanny. That same year, we had another meme about fall fashion, the Thanksgiving uniform. Specifically, a black long sleeve top, orange or brown suede skirt with black knee-high boots. There were other variations in colors, but that was the blueprint. So obviously both of these memes reference women being basic, which is one of the most classic insults. Women who like popular things like pumpkin spice lattes are unoriginal and boring, they say. Also important to note, most of these specifically refer to the basic white girl, which is a whole meme on its own. Basic and basic white girl generally carry negative connotations, but we've definitely seen some people try to own them or self-identify as such, perhaps to be self-aware. Maybe this is similar to the reclamation of bimbo. Fascinating, but I don't have time to get into all this in this video. Anyway, just wanted to point out that these things may be stereotypically basic white girl things, but obviously liking these things or dressing this way is not exclusive to white girls and women. So let's get into it. In 2022, of course, these specific outfits do seem a bit outdated, though the central elements are pretty classic. Update the style of the sweater, the skirt, the boots, and you could probably make a very cute, practical, wearable outfit. I recently watched this Lainey Ozark video about fall trends, and basically, some people are already embarrassed about what they wore last fall. They participated in some trends, and now they think it's cringy. Micro trends make things come in and out of fashion so fast, especially online. But as Lainey pointed out, there's a massive gap between what is seen as wearable on fashion TikTok versus what's wearable in person. While these outfits aren't seen as the peak of trendy or unique fashion by TikTok users, they're still popular, worn by a lot of people, and often come back year after year. I think oversaturation can make us get the ick for something trendy. We get fatigued by certain prints, colors, or cuts when we see them everywhere. Especially when you make a specific combination for an outfit, it just screams fall 2020 or summer 2021. So again, it's not just that suede skirts in general are outdated, it's especially that that black top suede skirt and high boots in these specific colors would remind us of Thanksgiving 2019. This is all very confusing to me because I don't think I really participate in micro trends. And in my brain, fall has such a distinct wardrobe. Sweaters, turtlenecks, autumnal colors, tights, boots. These are timeless items that I don't have to repurchase year after year. Commodification puts consumers in a box, making us believe that our clothing is distinctly seasonal. Like this color is only for fall. You can't wear that in the winter. You can't wear white after Labor Day. But then next year, that color that you do own will be outdated and you'll have to buy an entirely new wardrobe for each season every year. So anyway, I think everyone should wear what you enjoy. But regardless, I again would recommend shopping secondhand especially if you want to hop on some trends, try them out. But also know that it is very much okay to wear like more simple staple outfits. Again, what we see online is so warped by like these hyper experimental fashionable people, but most people are just doing, doing the kind of regular stuff. So back to the overall aesthetic of fall. In this New York Times article about Christian girl Autumn, the queen of fall from the meme, Caitlin Covington, describes how she utilizes fall aesthetics for her influencer and blogging work. 
Going back to that idea of seasonal performance, she talks about how she has to maximize the fall vibes on her Instagram feed. This is her peak work season. One of her many content trips is an annual trip to Vermont to make the most of the autumnal landscape. Covington said, the engagement rate on a picture with fall leaves versus like some green trees is just insane. It's so different. It really goes to show, apparently you can't just have fall fashion, you've got to have the right background to complete the desired look. It's fascinating that one season's aesthetic is such a big part of her brand as an influencer. It reminds me of the Blue Ass Water era, where Instagram models were known for their bodies, but also for the beautiful beach settings that surrounded them. Creators who find themselves in a niche like Blue Ass Water Instagram or Fall Queen Instagram feel compelled to stick to it, because otherwise their content will underperform. It won't meet the audience's expectations. Anyway, media set in fall, including Covington's Instagram photos, help to reinforce the idea that it's not really fall unless you live in a sort of place that has that beautiful landscape of brightly colored leaves. But we don't all have that landscape or that fall experience. Yes, the leaves may be falling, but it can look like this and this and this. These perfect picturesque settings are probably rare, but we imagine them as as the norm. One show that represents the fall ideal is Gilmore Girls, which I've actually never watched, but even I know it is the epitome of fall. Each season premiered in the fall so audiences could experience the autumnal glory along with Rory and Lorelai. To me, Gilmore Girls and other similar shows exemplify this specific autumn ideal that I feel like I've only ever seen on TV. It's a small town, usually in New England. It's safe, comfortable, everyone knows each other. Here's a quote from Collider. The townspeople always seem to be gearing up for the colder months marked by their signature charming and quirky town events. And they're heavy on themes like community and friendship, which tend to hit harder during colder months. Consuming fall media made me realize I am nostalgic for something I never truly experienced. I've never lived anywhere like Stars Hollow, yet that is the vision of fall in my brain. Continuing on, let's discuss how fall is commodified. What are people compelled to buy into and why? I think it comes down to a combination of nostalgia, sensory memories, and seasonal scarcity. We want to replicate our memories or create memories of what an ideal fall looks, smells, tastes, and feels like. So let's start with flavors, obviously the most iconic being pumpkin spice, which actually does not contain pumpkin. Dictionary.com says, it's a mix of all the spices that go into a pumpkin pie. Cinnamon, nutmeg, cloves, ginger, and sometimes allspice. Pumpkin spice has been incredibly popular and this flavor is almost synonymous with fall at this point. These days you can find pumpkin spice versions of everything from drinks and snacks to even quote spam, peanut butter, and lattes for dogs. The Guardian says the pumpkin spice industrial complex was a more than $600 million market in 2018, and that wasn't even the peak year. At this point, it's hard to remember what fall was like, nay, what life was like before the era of pumpkin spice. In 2003, Starbucks launched the pumpkin spice latte. It has been a hit, and it especially boomed around the 2008 recession. I found this very interesting. There's something about the association with the warm, spiced flavor and the feeling of togetherness and better times that catapulted the PSL as a fall staple during the housing crisis. It provided nostalgia and comfort in a really shitty time for jobs, families, and mental health. So yeah, people were willing to spend like four bucks on a little treat for themselves to hide the fact that everything sucks. Sounds familiar. But Starbucks definitely capitalizes on that whole treat yourself messaging. So not only treat yourself to a nice bevy, but why not go for the warm, comforting, limited time only pumpkin spice latte? And perhaps throw in a pumpkin loaf or a pumpkin spice cake pop. Looking at Google Trends, starting from around fall 2010, the PSL grew in popularity each year until peaking in search in 2015, though it's still very popular today. Many people count down until pumpkin spice season begins. Starbucks treats this as a huge launch every year, and many fans will rush to buy their first PSL of the season. If it's so popular, shouldn't it just be a permanent menu item? <laughs> No, this is all about the power of seasonal scarcity in marketing. Quote, this PSL season is a mirage. Cinnamon, nutmeg, and allspice are available year round. 
But like a McRib, the forced scarcity makes the PSL feel like a fleeting object and something that should be consumed before time expires. We see this so much, especially in fall. Stores get flooded with limited edition foods and flavors. Apple, pumpkin, maple, autumnal, harvest, everything. For example, Trader Joe's always comes out with really interesting seasonal products. TJ's fans love to try new stuff. It gets you into the seasonal spirit. And again, you don't know how long supplies will last. Maybe this thing will only be here for a few weeks. Or maybe it's your absolute favorite that only comes back once a year. This scarcity encourages you to buy things right away without a second thought. And it can also lead to some small scale panic buying and stockpiling of these items. Some people buy up all the supply they can of things they love just in case it gets discontinued. There's somewhat of a cult obsession with Trader Joe's products, but that is a rabbit hole in itself for another time. So in writing this video, I wanted to learn why pumpkins? Is Big Pumpkin behind it all? I needed a bit of history and context. I found this article from Smithsonian Mag. So pumpkins are a type of squash, they're native to North America, and they've been a big part of many indigenous cultures. Even up to 10,000 years ago, squashes were the first domesticated plant in the Americas. Indigenous people used the squashes for their seeds and as containers. Native Americans cooked the squashes in a matter of ways, roasting them, cutting them into stews, pounding them into powder, or drying strips of it into vegetable jerky. So if you thought this pumpkin everything trend was new? <laughs> Buckle up, bestie. For many Native Americans, pumpkins and other squashes were truly central to their lifestyle. They were utilizing these local, abundant crops in a variety of ways, which were very creative and practical. Compared to these days, where pumpkin stuff is more of a marketing ploy that is artificially forced into more and more products. It's necessity versus novelty. And guess what? There's a connection between nostalgia and pumpkins. When masses of people moved from the rural countryside to urban areas during the Industrial Revolution, zucchini and other squashes were sold in city markets. The pumpkin, however, remained on farms, used as livestock feed. City dwellers ached with nostalgia for their connection to the land. The pumpkin served as a symbol of that farming tradition. The pumpkin represents abundance and pure agrarian ideals. This is fascinating because I think it's still relevant. Most of us don't have childhood memories on the farm, but those memories are created through basically cosplaying farm life and activities through things like pumpkin patches and apple picking. Pumpkins are a major part of the fall aesthetic. You may carve them for Halloween or otherwise keep them around for decor. You could just buy one at a store, but going to a pumpkin patch or farm is an activity. Some pumpkin patches are very elaborate with hay rides, concerts, and more. And of course, of course, people love taking cute family photos at the pumpkin patch. All of these activities contribute to the cutesy farm fall aesthetic. I think it's really interesting how we engage with these crops. Again, pumpkins, apples, on one hand they represent our solid yet trendy seasonal flavors, but also they're this nostalgic symbol of the simple life that many of us have never experienced. We're looking back on rural history with maple tinted glasses. In fall, we want to get outside and feel connected to the land and the harvest. It's very cozy, wholesome branding. By the way, when it comes to romanticizing quote-unquote simpler times, similar to the glamorized divisions of the 50s, we have to be careful not to forget or ignore history. For example, Thanksgiving. To some, it's just a day of family, great food, and football. But it's important to note, the narrative of Thanksgiving that American kids are taught is a sanitized, whitewashed version of history. It ignores the brutality of colonization and the genocide of Native Americans. So obviously, of course, we can enjoy nature and aesthetics and all the great elements of fall, but at the same time, we can be knowledgeable and respectful of important historical context. Now getting into the bummer of it all. Elephant in the room might be that climate change is making us try to cling onto fall more than ever. We have been experiencing longer, hotter, more brutal summers that creep into the fall months. It could be October or November. I should be wearing sweaters. The fact that it's too hot feels wrong and sad. This is part of why that first slight chill is such a relief. Of course, the temperature is a bit nicer, but it's twofold. It's also a comforting signal that the season is actually changing. With climate change, fall as a season is actually getting shorter, and this picturesque fall as we know it, may disappear, which is extremely depressing. This also contributes to seasonal scarcity. It's like remembering that many of our beloved coastal cities may be underwater in a few years or decades. 
we want to hang on to them or at the very least truly appreciate them as long as we can. And yikes, sorry for that reminder. Anne Helen Peterson recently wrote about her theory of sprawling holidays, which counteracts this seasonal scarcity by artificially elongating fall celebrations. Especially in recent years through COVID lockdowns, we have missed out on a lot of our beloved traditions. We couldn't be social, we were barely going outside, so we weren't really experiencing seasons at all. The only way we could was through products, like decorating the inside of your apartment, eating seasonal foods, or watching your favorite comfort movies and shows on repeat. When it comes to Halloween, kids and teens missed out on a few years of fun. In many ways, we all want to make up for lost time. So in turn, we've seen Halloween turn into Weekend and even Weeks. And by the way, I want to give a shout out to the Halloween lovers. For some, Halloween is basically its own season, like separate from any other fall festivities. As soon as the skeletons hit the store, it is spooky season, and immediately on November 1st, it's Christmas. I think you're either a cozy Thanksgiving pumpkin spice person or a Halloween spooky season type of person. Let me know what you are in the comments. So rather than Halloween being one day in fall, it is a highly anticipated main event of the whole season. It's all about the buildup. Peterson wrote, Leading up to Halloween, there were pumpkin patches, cider donuts, corn mazes. Then for Halloween weekend itself, school parties, block parties, church parties, trunk or treat events, haunted houses. For some families, this requires multiple different costumes for each participant. Once only reserved for college kids throwing three-day ragers, the multi-day spooky sprawl has creeped into everything fall. Candy bags arrived in stores earlier, decor started popping up on shelves in August, and the Almighty PSL came back to the Starbucks menu before the official start of fall. This is because, quote, commodification and consumption become the primary ways that holidays are expressed and experienced. The primary affect is one of near constant purchasing, unboxing, and arranging. So if it's not really fall without all the fall goodies, does true seasonality even matter anymore? If seasons aren't really about the timing or the weather, they're about products and the performance of the season, then technically we could adjust the timing as much as we want to make it start earlier or last longer. Real markers of fall are diminishing, but the contrived markers, pumpkin spice, Halloween parties, events, are coming to the forefront of what it means to be in fall. It never really feels like fall anymore, so I'm just going to continue grasping at these psychological connections and these products. I'm going to continue to buy and consume things that comfort me. I'm going to go to the parties. I'm going to try to cling on to these feelings. So to wrap up this pumpkin spiced video, I had a very fun time researching this with Sheridan. It was fascinating to see some of the reasons behind why these fall favorites have been heavily promoted. It's all about the pumpkin lobby. <laughs> Lastly, I just wanna say I know that fall and the holiday season as a whole can be rough for a lot of people. It can be a really lonely time. The weather can contribute to seasonal depression. So I am just sending you all love. I hope that everyone is able to find little bits of joy wherever you can, whether that's in a lot of candles or a cozy, cozy sweater. Oh, before I forget, I was supposed to mention um, basically promoting my own videos so I can get back in the algorithm's good graces. A little, little, little ask to please like, comment, add videos to watch later. I think that helps bring it back in your YouTube algorithm. Yeah, I made my video about laziness, which I really, really enjoyed. My video about mobile games was weird and fun. <laughs> and I hope that you've enjoyed this discussion of fall. So thank you again to ThreadUp. You can shop my picks with the link below and use code Tiffany for an extra 30% off and free shipping for your first order. And lastly, shout out to my sweet, sweet patrons. You can support me on patreon.com if you are able to and would like to. I make a bonus video every month this time I'm doing a behind the video about my last video about laziness explaining my process how long it takes me to do different things I think it's interesting and extra thank yous to my executive producer tier. We have Uwu Face, Abby Hayden, Eric Danielson, Freshly Laundered, Jackie King, Jill Hoffman, Julie Leva, Kristen Holloman, Matthew Gray, Megan Collins, Megcat33, Nicole Louise, Online DBT Skills, Rohana Barden, Sarah Kemi, Stevie May, Tom Walker, Treffa, and VivianOladon.com. Thank you so much for being patrons. It means a lot. 
Okay, that is all. I hope you guys enjoyed this fun little setup. Look at me doing a little bit of a, a teeny bit of set design. I'm going to blow out all these candles and go to bed. Oh, yes, I'm using the end cards. Watch my last video about laziness if you haven't seen it yet. Laziness does not exist. <gasps> or does it? Let's, let's discuss. Okay, thanks. Bye.